Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. So this is the last module of the course, that is module five, which will be in two parts, part one and part two. Uh, module five looks at mitigating risk, supporting preparedness and strengthening resilience to build forward better post-COVID-19 recovery. We've been talking a lot about risk during this course, about how to manage these risks, or cope with these risks, and how to be resilient to these risk or to to and how to be resilient, sorry, to these different shocks and and stresses that we may actually encounter. In in that case, we referred a lot to the COVID-19 pandemic, but what we will be looking more in module five is how, what is resilience and what are the different types of capacities that are needed to enhance resilience. Then when we talk about the capacities, how do I link them, these capacities that is absorptive, adaptive and transformative capacities to strengthen resilience. And then look at a resilience system analysis. How do you know that you're resilient? What kind of system do you need to have in place to face other shocks and stresses? We will do that in part one of module five. And then in part two, we come to the different policies or strategies that are adopted to build resilience and deal with risk that we encounter as a country, as a household, or as an individual. So what is resilience? In fact, we've been looking in module one, two, and three, and even in part of module four, we've talked a lot about vulnerability. Resilience and vulnerability do not represent opposite ends of the spectrum. They, in fact, form part of the same equation. If you would recall, in module one, we did look at resilience and vulnerability and even wrote the equation there uh, when we, we look at vulnerability and refer to resilience, which is an important component. So they are not opposite. They form part of the same equation. And when I refer to resilience, it is the capacity and ability of communities, system, household, and countries to absorb and recover from shocks, while at the same time being able to adapt and transform their structures to face long-term shocks, stresses, uncertainty, and any change that can happen at any point in time. So this capacity and ability to prevent, mitigate, or cope with risks and also recover from these shocks is very important and makes you as a country or as a community, as a household, to be more resilient. When we refer to vulnerability, remember we said that the focus will be on vulnerability to poverty. Again, when we talk to resil about resilience, sorry, we can also link that from a poverty perspective. Resilience will be a set of capacities that enables households to remain out of poverty over the long term, even in the face of shocks. So how can these households reduce, mitigate, adapt to, and recover from shocks? So if we are able to do that at the level of household, and if communities are able to do that, and if countries are able to do that, then it will reduce their vulnerability and also help in moving towards inclusive growth. So inclusive growth has been the focus of many reports and of many countries because there is a, a great motivation to reduce vulnerability to poverty and build resilience of communities and household to poverty. To handle uh, adversity and to change, also make changes to adapt, 
we need a number of capacities. And these capacities are important in the face of shocks. When we refer to resilience, it can be enhanced by strengthening these three different types of capacities. These capacities which we will refer to will be absorptive capacity, adaptive capacity, and transformative capacity. For each one of, of these, I will be giving an example. For absorptive capacity, the ability of a system to prepare for, mitigate, or prevent negative impacts using predetermined coping mechanism to preserve and restore essential basic structures and functions. For instance, uh, absorptive capacities are how you absorb the, sh the shock in a sense. For example, you may delay debt repayments, you may take children out of school because you can't pay school anymore. You may go for an early harvest, you can't wait, so because you need the money from that harvest. Adaptive capacity could be you adapt your situation by diversification of your livelihoods in, or trying to find other sources of, of income or planting new crops, etc. or introducing drought resistant seeds. So you try to make changes, uh, but in order to, to face uh, and to make to face the shock and make you more resilient. So you will try to adjust, modify, or change the characteristics of the system and actions to moderate potential future damages, right? So you will try to mitigate, to reduce the impact of potential damages. Transformative capacity is the ability to create a new system, right? So that the shock will no longer have any impact, like infrastructure, urban planning measures, for instance, to, re to, to reduce the probability of floods, right, which will affect communities. So you plan, you build infrastructure to, so that you don't have, you don't face uh, the impact of, let's say, flash floods or any, any floods which may affect communities. In fact, these three are related. So they are linked to each other we can link absorptive, adaptive, and transformative capacities in order to strengthen resilience. These three capacities are often used simultaneously. They are not independent. They are linked to each other, and they can, use, they can be used simultaneously by communities or by countries. For example, household within a coastal community, for example. Let's take these household living on the coastal regions. Uh, and we say that they may use absorptive capacity to build barriers to protect their resources against annual flooding, use adaptive capacity to alter how they cultivate crops, yeah? collect drinking water in new ways, so they are amending the system, and transform the way they manage natural resources to prevent uh, let's say, floods, to prevent the, the high impacts of floods, uh, altering the attitudes about the role and partnership of different community groups, get them involved, try to find solutions, and reduce the impact of future shocks. So resilience system, in fact, how do I build a resilient system? How do I analyze the resilience uh, of a particular community or, or uh, of a country or different regions, areas of a country? In fact, doing a resilient system analysis, it builds on what we just did, the risk management approach. It doesn't replace the traditional risk management approach, which we will look at in module four. Right, It just builds on that and it provides an in-depth analysis of how resilient you can be as a community or uh, as a household or as a country. So first of all, to build, to analyze resilience, 
to build a resilient system a framework is you need to understand the risks or the shocks which are likely to happen. So you need to have an overview of the risk landscape in a particular context. Then the next step is to see how those risks will affect the society, the system in place. So you need to gather information about the risk landscape, think about how these risks affect society, get information how system are set up to cope with those risks, what makes them resilient or what makes them not resilient. And if they are not resilient, what can be done to boost resilience, right? What policies, what strategies, what measures can be put in place to boost resilience and also help the different parts of that system to either absorb those shocks or adapt so that they are less exposed to those shocks or transform so that the shock will no longer affect them. So at the end of the day, what we want when we do a resilient system analysis is to get a resilient system that will change the overall context, that will change the risk landscape, reducing the risk, see where society needs to improve, where the system needs to improve in order to boost its resilience. So we need, at the end of this kind of analysis, a resilient system. Now, very often, uh, there is a whole conceptual framework which is adopted and OECD does it well. Looking at the risk landscape, what kind of risk we have done that in module one and module two, looking at different types of risk, shocks, et cetera, distresses. And remember what we did initially was looking at this risk, what is the level of analysis? Is it at the household level, individual level, community level, or a region, provincial level, or national level? So how do they, what is your level of analysis? How are you accounting for the different risks? And then try to devise programs, actions in line with absorptive capacity, adaptive capacity and transformative capacity. But again, what is very important is at which level are you doing it? National, regional, community, household or individual. Once you get your measures right, at the level you want it, you want these measures to apply, you want these actions to be taken, then you will come with a resilient system. Of course, for this to happen depends on political will, uh, uncertainty which may exist. Of course, you need to make sure what that there are other risks that you will encounter in the process. The time frame to build a resilient system. Uh, the complexity of the whole system, right? So there are factors which need to be included there when you do a resilient system analysis. But more important of all is at what level will be your analysis. Now, you will recall from module three, we talk about systemic risk and we also uh, look at uh, systemic recovery, and we look at impacts in different sectors across different, uh, different components, different channels of transmission. So when we will talk about resilience as well, when we will try to uh, adopt policy strategies to build resilience, we can't adopt silos approaches to development. This will not work. When we have systemic risk, there is a need for systemic solutions to achieve systemic recovery. So to promote resilience in communities to systemic risk, we need a system approach rather than individual policies or one-off policies. So we need an approach that focuses on all facets of risk reduction, including preventing hazards, reducing exposure and vulnerability, 
and building adaptive capacity. Resilience emphasizes, in fact, the importance of recovery and adaptation in the aftermath of any crisis. So recovery is very important, as well as adaptation. Now, when we talk about crisis and we talk about the COVID-19 pandemic, we know that disruptions have taken place in a number of areas, be it health, economic, social, political, in many cases. So there is a need for systemic solution and a set of strategies in different sectors. We've seen that COVID-19 has also provided an opportunity to address other emergencies, like climate change, for instance. People have been have seen that we can manage climate change more effectively. And the COVID-19 pandemic have, have shown how vulnerable we are, all of us, irrespective of our, our socio-demographics. It has shown how vulnerable the world is and as a matter of fact, we've also linked it to climate change crisis. So we've been thinking a lot in terms of new strategies and new policies, how to make us more resilient to shocks. And climate change, we all know, has been there for a number of years, and it is a crisis which is likely to be here and affecting us, uh, in, affecting us more in the coming years. So sometimes what we can say is that when there is a crisis, uh, whether it's COVID-19 pandemic, for example, we are not just bouncing back, but we are bouncing forward because it has helped us to think and also come up with new strategies, uh, new policies, which before that we would not be able to think about or we would not be able to to see its application. So in a case, uh, it is an, a crisis is sometimes like thinking that we will be going further, better and bouncing forward. So this is the first part of module five and the second part of module five will be dealing more with, uh, with policies that countries can adopt in different areas to build resilience against shocks. Thank you.